Last week we had the privilege of thinking through and looking at the amazing forgiveness of God in our life. You know, that is so powerful. To realize that we are truly forgiven people and that God doesn't hold our past against us. God doesn't hold anything against us. He loves us, He cares for us, and He desires that we move forward in His name's sake to change our world. Well, you know, receiving God's forgiveness is one thing. Giving God's forgiveness is another. It, it seems like it's easier for us to figure out why others should forgive us uh, in our failings than it is for us to forgive others in their failings. Because when we look at this, we, we look at it and we know when we do something wrong, most of the time we're very aware that our our intentions may have been different. We, we were just at a point where maybe we were at a breaking point. We, we can figure out some reason why we did what we did, and we can justify that in some cases. And, and in cases when we can't justify it, we will, we will flip it over and we'll say, but we still need to be forgiven anyway. It's it's easier for us to see that than to see that in someone else. Because many times when something happens negative toward us, we think very negatively toward the person who has offended us, and we look at it as if this is a premeditated, planned thing that they did on their own. They decided to do it. They knew what they were doing. And in reality, they're no different than we are. Sometimes they do things without thinking. Sometimes they do things because they're pushed to the brink for a reason that we may not even be aware of. Sometimes things happen in their life that they are willfully disobedient about. But again, you know, we, we need to ask, do they deserve our forgiveness? Yes. It's hard because the risk is there that they would somehow misuse that. But let me ask you this. This week as I was thinking about this particular message, I was thinking about Somebody ask a question. How many times should we forgive? Let me ask you, how many times do you want to be forgiven? Maybe that's a better question. Because honestly, if we, if we look at that, we go, I want to be forgiven every time I fail. I literally want to be forgiven every time I fail. I don't want God putting a limit on it, and I don't want God coming up to me at one point in my life and say, oh, by the way, Butch, you crossed the line. You've gone too far. It's over. My forgiveness only goes this far. If we remember last week's message, and if you didn't hear last week's message, you can go back and listen to it online. God's forgiveness doesn't have limits. So when I ask myself, how should, how should I limit my forgiveness? My forgiveness needs to look like the forgiveness that I have received. And so I need to be forgiving. Is that easy? No, not at all. Many times it's very difficult to grasp. But the Bible many, many, many times paints forgiveness for us. More than 75 stories of the Bible are geared around this concept of forgiveness. And then today, when we're looking at this passage, this is in the book of Philemon, the letter of Philemon, and it's right before the book of Hebrews in the New Testament. It's one page long, so it's a very brief letter. And in and, and these few verses... In these 25 verses, we hear a lot about forgiveness. You see, Philemon was a man who was a Christian. 
who had been someone who had ministered to Paul. Onesimus was a slave that Philemon owned that had wronged Philemon. But yet, in a jail context, Paul had led Philemon to Jesus. And so Paul, I mean, had led Onesimus to Jesus. So Paul appeals to Philemon and says, Would you be forgiving of this man? All right? So in the first seven verses of this, as we look at it, we're going to consider some of the characteristics of a person that is a forgiving person. Before we go there, I want us to think through just very briefly a couple of things here. If I choose to be unforgiving... I am personally being rebellious. I am being blatantly disobedient to God. I am telling God, I'm not going to do what you want me to do. Now, I want to ask you something. When you and I are in that attitude, do we deserve God's forgiveness? Hmm. So haven't we put ourselves in the same place as we put our other person? We've become unforgiving. And that unforgiveness in our own life locks us up in a prison to our past. We, we look at all of our yesterdays, all of our hurts, all of our, all of our things that have gone wrong, everything. We are in prison to that past when we are unforgiving also, when we are unforgiving, we're, we're producing in our life a, an attitude of bitterness. And bitterness is more than a sin. It's an infection that gets in our life and literally changes everything. It distorts our view about everything. When bitterness gets into us, it changes the way I look at the goodness of God and it changes the way I look at people completely. I've had people before, you know, as, as I've said before, sometimes in our uh, counseling sessions or something like that, I'll ask a, a husband or a wife to write down, I'll, I'll ask them together, write down the things that you know are wrong in your marriage. And man, the pencils are smoking. <laughs> Dip it in water. Cool it off. <laughs> and then I ask them to do one more thing before we start our conversation. Write down everything good about that person. <laughs> and, and so... You've got this three-page list of all the things that are wrong. And after coaching them a while, they came up with two things that were good. Let me tell you what that's a sign of. That's a sign of bitterness. Because bitterness distorts everything and robs you of the ability to see the blessing. even the blessings of God. Another thing unforgiveness does is the Bible tells us it gives Satan a chance to work in your life freely by invitation. When you and I are unforgiving to somebody, we're not saying, God, come in, change my heart, change my attitude, work in my life, move me. We're saying, Satan, have a heyday. Have a free time. Enjoy my life. Destroy my life. Mm. In light of that, the last thing I want to point out that unforgiveness does is it hinders our relationship with God. 
We cannot be bitter and unforgiving and open to Satan in our life and be in fellowship with Christ. Mm. Matter of fact, the Bible tells us that our forgiveness of others and our forgiveness from God are connected. That's not talking about salvation. That's talking about ongoing relationship of a believer. If you choose personally to not forgive, you have chosen personally to not receive the forgiveness of God in your own life over matters that you're dealing with at the time. That's your choice. And as a believer, you can either live in fellowship with God or you can live out of fellowship with God and be miserable in that relationship. It's your choice. It's my choice. So, Paul is writing Philemon and he's saying, Philemon, we've got a situation here. We've got Onesimus who did you wrong. And we're going to address that over the next three weeks. Okay? Today we're going to be looking at the spiritual characteristics of someone who is forgiving. Okay? Let's look at Paul's writing to Philemon. Beginning at verse 1, it says, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved brother and work, fellow worker, and to Apphia, our sister, and to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always making mention of you in my prayers because I hear of your love and of the faith which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints. And I pray that the fellowship of your faith may become effective through the knowledge of every good thing which is in you for Christ's sake. For I have come to have much joy and comfort in your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, brother. Okay? Now, I want us to understand something. Paul is not writing flattery. Flattery is deceitful. And Paul is not deceitful here. He's stating some real things about Philemon. So what we see is he's appealing to Philemon to continue to act on the basis of how he's already acting, but continue to act toward Onesimus in the same way. Okay? So when we think about the spiritual characteristics of those who are ones that forgive, the first characteristic I want us to see is there is a strong desire to please God. In your life and in my life, it is very important that we have an attitude that we move through the day of, I want my life to be pleasing to God. Many of us take that idea into heart. Some of us don't necessarily make that a daily thought in our process of thinking. We, we kind of... We kind of go, well, I'm living my life, I'm doing my things, and occasionally I'll pray, occasionally I'll study the Bible, occasionally I'll make God my focus, occasionally I'll ask, is what I am doing bringing glory to God? But that's not the attitude of what he's talking about here. He's saying live in a life attitude of one who desires to please God. In Philemon chapter 1, verse 4, and the first part of verse 5 is, Paul says, I thank my God always, making mention of you in my prayers, because I hear 
of your love and of the faith which you have toward the Lord Jesus. He loved Jesus Christ. He had faith in Jesus Christ. And if we love Jesus Christ and have faith in Jesus Christ, then our life needs to be geared to walk in a way where we are walking to please God. When Paul was writing the Thessalonians, he was saying to them that they ought to please God in how they walk in their life. And, and when we're thinking about that, we're thinking about how do we walk every day? Not just Sunday, not just a few days, but every day. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 10, it says, so that you walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, to please Him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of the Lord. You and I, if we're going to be a people that is a forgiving people, we've got to focus on centering on God. We realize that in the struggle, our focus gets off. In the frustration, we, we, we start focusing on us. How do I feel about this? How am I, I, I'm hurt by this. I'm, I'm whatever. We, we live in that. And we realize that there, sometimes the reason why we're so frustrated at others is they're so self-centered. I'm not going to say that your forgiveness of someone else is going to make them not self-centered. But the forgiveness is not so much about the other person as it is you. I want you personally to become a person who is God-centered. If you want to be free in your life, if you want to live a life that's filled with God's goodness, if you want to live your life in a way that you're not bound to your past or living under the bitterness of everything else, you've got to take care of yourself. You cannot take care of yourself and be unforgiving. So please, God, walk with Him. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, it says, Whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Now Paul was saying to Philemon, Philemon, I recognize this in you. That's who you are. You're a person who loves God and has a heart for God. But not only are you a person that has a love for God and a heart for God, the second thing we see is that Philemon had a concern for people. Notice there in Philemon chapter 1, verse 5, where it says, again, because I hear of your love, not only toward God, but toward the saints. You've got a love for people. You've got a desire to see things work well. There, there, is a, there is a characteristic that drives you because of that love. And isn't it interesting that the Bible tells us that we can know. You know what? People wonder, how do I know for certain whether or not I'm saved? <laughs> you know, one of the things that the Bible tells us is we can know for certain that we've passed from death to life if we love each other. Now, in the struggle of life, there are going to be times where we love deeply and times that we love less. But there should never be times that we don't love. Every relationship, whether it's a friendship, a work relationship, a school relationship, or a marriage, goes through difficulties. Before Carol and I married, one of the, one of the greatest counsels I had was from my great-grandmother, who was married to her first husband for 67 years. And he, she talked about 
the conflicts as well as the good times, but that the focus was loving one another through it all. How in the world can we do that? How can we love other people? We're given a very good example in Jesus Christ. Because even with all that went on, think about it. Everything that went on to put Jesus on the cross, there on the cross, he stretched out, He's dying, and what's his word? Father, forgive them. Forgive them. How can you forgive somebody who has been so deceitful? How can you forgive somebody who has been so brutal? How can you forgive somebody in that circumstance Look to Christ. Because I want you to understand, just as I need to understand, when Jesus is sitting on the cross, dying, it isn't just for the sin of those people at that day. Jesus is looking at us and saying the same thing. Wow. So the Lord says to his disciples, the world will know you're my disciples if you have love one for another. And then in 1 John chapter 2, verse 10, it says, the one who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause of stumbling in him. So you may be going, well, my brother's a Christian. My sister's a Christian. And they're not acting like a Christian. Okay? Then be the big boy or the big girl in the situation and act the way God wants you to. Just because someone else does not act right does not give us permission to not act according to what God has called us to do. So Paul is saying to Philemon, Philemon, I realize Onesimus has hurt you. I realize there may be payment that is necessary. And we'll get to that in another sermon. But he says, I want you to act according to how God has been moving you in your heart and in your life. Love God deeply and love others. The third thing I want us to see is there is a desire for real fellowship. Real fellowship with Christ can only come if we are forgiving. Real fellowship with others can only come if we're forgiving. And you know what? Our world has no concept of forgiveness. Our world has gone crazy. And you know what? Outside of Jesus Christ, forgiveness is, I believe, literally impossible. But I think even inside the faith in Christ, we need to work hard to be a forgiving people. In Philemon chapter 1, verse 6, it says, And I pray that the fellowship of your faith may become effective. The fellowship can only become effective if it's two-directional. First, with God, we need to make sure that that relationship is right. That's why anytime I'm counseling somebody, whether it's in a relational issue or anything else, I want to move them back to the place of what is your relationship with God like? What is your fellowship with Him like? How are you walking with him on a daily basis? How are you walking with him? You know, not just how are you starting your day, but how are you living your day? What are you doing there? What's that fellowship like? You need that. But then, how are you treating other people? How is your fellowship there? 
I, I like what Galatians says when, when Paul writes to the Galatian church and says in chapter 3, verse 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. I know in, in our world today there's a big struggle between racism and all the different things like that. You know what? There is one cure. And that's Jesus. A government can't cure it because actually the functional way government works creates more division. And it doesn't matter if you're in a democracy or in a communism. The basic government stance usually will always create division. But yet, one of the things the world doesn't want to hear from right now is the church. Because the church says, hey, look, you've got the Jew and you've got the Gentile. That's, that's you, your Jewish believers and the rest of the world. And the Bible says, in that relationship of fellowship, there is no separation. You've got slave and you've got free. There is no separation. You've got male, you've got female. You know, I hear all the time, well, there's the, the glass ceiling and a, and a female can't rise. Do you know Christianity has done more to promote women throughout history than any other group? And you may go, well, I don't see it. Well, then you need to study your Bible. And you need to study its impact on society. Because it opened the world to a group of people that the world was not open to prior to that. There's a fellowship there. We're all one in Christ. I've been amazed through my journeys to be able to sit down with people who were once enemies in war. I mean enemies to the point of hand-to-hand -hand combat of killing one another. But in Christ, they could sit at a dinner table and share in the joy of the fellowship of the Lord. How does that happen? It only happens through the life-changing power of Jesus Christ. Forgiveness can only come in that place. You and your life, me and my life, we can only have that forgiveness in those type of fellowships. So we have to understand, you know what? If you have a domestic helper that works at your house, they're not your slave. They're your employee. And they're not just your employee. They're your brother and sister in Christ if they're believers in Christ. Treat them that way. If you're working for your employer... The same thing. There's not to be that divisiveness of, well, the only reason why they they've got all this money. Listen, if they didn't have the money, they wouldn't be hiring you. Begin to look at the blessing of what God see. See, your own our own bitterness and our own attitude of superiority in so many different areas. We can, we can have that situation based on our education or our income or anything else. But I want you to understand, your income is broken apart in the sense that it doesn't matter what you've got. Your education is different. It doesn't matter what you've got. Ultimately, it's about fellowshipping with God and fellowshipping with each other. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8 says, Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. It is, it's, it's that attitude of fan the flame. If you've ever had a charcoal grill that you've been trying to get it started, you can take and, and you can fan that flame so that that flame gets hotter and hotter and hotter and you just keep fanning it and, and you make it hotter. You do whatever you can to make it hotter. You know what? God is saying, your love for the other person you need to work on 
Sometimes it's hard work. Sometimes it's difficult work. But you move forward and share in that. In Psalm 133, verse 1, it says, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. That's where we need to be. And Paul is saying, Philemon, you, you love the Lord. You love others. You're desiring that fellowship. You're showing that you are a person who has the characteristics of one of those who is willing and able to forgive. The last thing is I want us to see there is a hope to be a blessing. Notice I didn't say a hope for a blessing. A hope to be a blessing. So in Philemon verse 7 there it says, For I have come to have much joy and comfort in your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, brother. You see, he was a blessing to others. When you've got the ability to bless others, do it. Move forward. Be that blessing because the Lord says it's more blessed to give than receive. Give your time. Give your, your abilities. Give your finances. Give in a way that's a blessing to others. Philemon had done that for Paul, and he's calling on him to do that for others. He reminds the, the Philippian church that they're not just to look out after their own interest, but also the interest of others. And it doesn't say if they've treated you well. As a matter of fact, the, the most puzzling thing in the Bible is the way God tells us to treat our enemies Sometimes I just wish Christians would treat each other like enemies, biblically. Because biblically, you're to love your enemy. You're to bless your enemy. You're to pray for your enemy. You're to lift and encourage your enemy. You're to do good for your enemy. You see, sometimes we won't even do that for believers. But in our life, we want to be a blessing. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 and 9, it says to sum up, All of you be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. And you are called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. You see, just like unforgiveness robs you of so many things, forgiveness allows us to be free from our past. It allows us to receive the gift and the fruit of the Spirit that just wipes out that bitterness. It allows us to have that close fellowship with God and open up the opportunities for others. Today, would we become people who live out the characteristics of a person who forgives? this morning if you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior it's very difficult to even consider what we've been talking about some people have said but it's it's not our culture listen if it doesn't come from your culture then you're looking at the wrong culture because as a believer in Jesus Christ you are no longer the culture you used to be you are a citizen of heaven you are a child of the King and he infills you with his self and can make you this new person. So I invite you to do that. Give your life to him. Give yourself to him and become a person of forgiveness. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this time. We just ask you right now to lead us to focus our attention on you.
and to allow you to move us to be a people of forgiveness. Thank you, Lord, for all your love. In Jesus' name, amen.